Good morning. Welcome to Mayflower Church, the good ship Mayflower. Happy Mother's Day. I know there are a lot of mothers that have come with their children today, so if you're sitting next to your mom, reach over right now and squeeze her hand and say Happy Mother's Day. That's an order? Okay. <laughs> and a reminder that no matter who you are, or whether you're a mother, or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Would you bow your heads with me? Gracious God, we've gathered in this room because it is a thin place, a place where heaven and earth can feel so close together that we would swear there's no separation at all. We need such a place to be honest about our own failures as well as those who have failed us. On this day when we honor mothers, help us to remember that whether someone has given birth or not, does not make you a mother, tenacious, self-sacrificing, unconditional love makes you a mother and the world is in desperate need of such mothering. Calling all moms and dads, there are wars to stop, systemic racism to call out, kids to educate as a sacred obligation, and way too many adults who do not know how to play nicely together. In a world where we spend so much of our time worrying about what we have and not nearly enough time worrying about what we are becoming, this thin place is a safe place to ask for an end to pretending, an end to illusions, an end to striving. For, yea, verily, we know that no amount of stuff will make us happy. Relationships make us happy. Having integrity makes us happy. Being vulnerable in the presence of another human being we trust makes us happy. The sound of children laughing makes us happy. The possibility of peace makes us happy. The chance to forgive someone makes us happy. Not to mention that it can start the world over again. So for everything our mothers did for us, and for everything they are still doing for us, we are grateful beyond words. Way to go, Mom. Amen. The scripture lesson this morning is really next week's scripture lesson, but I'll explain that. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. Here ends this reading inspired by God. May God grant to us wisdom and courage for interpretation. I want to talk about Pentecost this morning, even though it's not officially Pentecost, until next Sunday. Why? Because next Sunday, I will not be here, I'll be preaching in Weatherford, Oklahoma. Why will I be preaching in Weatherford, Oklahoma? Because some goofy clergy person had this bright idea that UCC ministers in our conference ought to exchange pulpits on Pentecost once a year. So, you know, we could get into each other's churches and meet new people and preach. And that goofy clergy person was me. 
I have been trying to get the conference to institute a conference-wide pulpit exchange for several years, and it's finally happening. And I'm going to meet the good folks at Weatherford. And David Wheeler, who's the pastor at Federated Church of Weatherford and also First Congregational Church of Norman, will be preaching here next Sunday. And if this is all not confusing enough, I have picked a very strange topic for this sermon because I can't quit thinking about something that I've actually never heard a sermon preached about before, vibration. In particular, a kind of theology of vibration, especially good vibration, as in that vernacular expression, good vibes. I'm picking up good vibes. I'm picking up good vibrations. Thank you, Beach Boys. We went from that anthem straight to the Beach Boys. You, you got to stay flexible here. <laughs> I'm picking up good vibrations. She's given me excitations. Well, okay, that's probably not the Holy Spirit they're talking about there. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking no, but I'm going to. And in this sermon, she is precisely that, the mysterious, fickle, unmistakable, irresistible force that gave birth to the church. And we'll sustain it if anything can. Good vibrations. A personal confession first. I'm thinking about vibration as a theological idea right now because I'm trying to write a book about God that takes quantum physics seriously. This is where the idea of the luminous web came from and why I speak so often in sermons about all our actions, whether loving or not, whether small or very significant, they all vibrate, they vibrate some strand of the web as if one were plucking a string on a musical instrument, which, if everything really is connected to everything else, will set the whole web trembling, vibrating, and that will change the world. We strike a singing bowl every Sunday morning for the same reason, to remind us all that we are all entangled, not just in the physics of creation, but in the tonality of creation, Listening to the Piedmont Singers last Sunday evening was part of this sermon decision. They, they pushed me over the edge. For those of you who were here and had the pleasure of hearing that wonderful college choral group as they performed in what is really an acoustically wonderful space, we, we take it for granted, but visitors rave about this place as a place to sing. You know what that was all about? Vibration. Primarily vocal cords, of course, but also drums and air moving through different sized organ pipes, producing pitched vibrations in harmony with vocal vibrations, and then it was all sent out over the air as packaged tonal vibrations to make harmony. And what is harmony? Well, I wouldn't know if you've heard me sing. <laughs> you, I don't know for sure, but... I mean, I should call in Clint Williams here to explain all this because he's the expert, but you know how shy and retiring Clint is. <laughs> so I'm not going to put him on the spot. But I suspect that he would agree that whatever else music is, it's at least this choreographed harmonic vibration, good vibrations. And last Sunday night, we were all picking up good vibrations. It moved us lifted us, excited us. I'm picking up good vibrations. The Holy Spirit's given me excitations. Good, 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 good vibrations. I dare you not to be humming that awful song when you leave this morning. <laughs> now about Pentecost. Uh, when the day of Pentecost had come, and listen closely, they were all together in one place. So, rule number one, the Holy Spirit prefers a gathering to a collection of isolated individuals. That's one reason why America is in the midst of a moral crisis. We are all together too alone with ourselves. You know, we're rugged individuals and all that, don't need nobody and all that. Yes, you do. Yes, you do need somebody. It's like eating alone. You can do it, but the conversation's not nearly as good. And actually, neither is the food. And suddenly from heaven, and when I think heaven here, I don't think up, 
but rather from God, from the good, from the place of the sacred, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind and it filled the entire house. So what's the first metaphor to describe the arrival of the Holy Spirit? Sound, not, not a form, not a visual, not anything that's seen, but vibration, good, 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 good vibration. Like the rush of a mighty wind, huh? We can relate to that around here, especially in the last few days. It's been windy. Small people were blown over. <laughs> and the ancients, they were fascinated with wind because wind was a force you could not see, but you could see the effects of. And of course, you can hear wind as well. And notice this wind fills, this wind fills the entire house. It's an indiscriminate force. It does not pick and choose, but it expands into all available space, kind of like, I don't know, love. Then here comes the most famous metaphor for Pentecost. Divided tongues as a fire rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there is a shift here to a visual image and it's a really archetypal one. Remember, a pillar of fire guided Moses out of the wilderness and God then appears in a burning bush which is not consumed. And now the disciples have become, if you will, individual burning bushes. I mean, if you want to be literal about it, their heads are on fire, but they were not consumed. And yet the effect of this euphoria was not visual but acoustical. Namely, they began to speak in other languages. They became multilingual and not a single one of them had a PhD. The power of this metaphor may be hard for us to understand, but it wouldn't have been to an observant Jew. It's obvious what this is about. In the story of the Tower of Babel, from which we get our word for speaking incomprehensibly to Babel, humans had tried to build a tower, remember, so high that it would pierce the clouds and give mere mortals access to heaven and to be with God. And so to punish their hubris, or maybe God wasn't up to begin with, what does God do? He confuses their tongues. Now, not only does it make it impossible to complete this project, because one guy says, pass me the hammer, but it sounds exactly like, pass me the peanut butter and jelly. Nobody can understand anybody but it serves also to explain why God would have allowed a world where there's all these different languages to begin with. I mean, wouldn't it have been easier if we spoke the same language? You know, for peace and harmony among the nations, save money on interpreters. I mean, wouldn't that be good vibrations? So the spirit arrives at the birth of the church as wind and its primary effect is to overcome the fundamental separation that is no entiendo, I do not understand, no comprendo, I do not comprehend. Because next to race, what is it that separates us fundamentally? It's language. So the Holy Spirit shows up and no entiendo becomes just entiendo, I understand. Comprendo, I comprehend. Or to translate this into the vernacular, I get you. Even though you are a Parthian and I am an Elamite, and Mama said we should be careful about even being in the same room together, or the next thing you know, a little Jewish princess will, you know, marry a Cretan, and there goes the neighborhood. Suffice it to say, these people did not all get along with each other, but, but they started picking up good vibrations. The Holy Spirit's given them excitation, and here's a great little piece of biblical trivia. Did you know that in Acts 2, there is the only story in the Bible in which a crowd is described in advance of the message given to the crowd? You know why? Because the crowd is the message. In fact, Luke tells this story as if, I don't know, some kind of big class reunion has gone awry, as if everyone was supposed to have their own space, Parthians with Parthians and Medes with Medes and over there are some Elamites with other Elamites and then because of a mix-up or I don't know a divine conspiracy or there's little space available during the harvest festival they all end up in the same gymnasium together listening to the same music it was a, a Jesus band and they had a groove on 
And suddenly everyone looks across the room at each other and, and they couldn't even be sure who was with them and who was against them, who was a Democrat and who was a Republican, who was a liberal and who was a conservative. They didn't even know which side of town they were from or what language they spoke or whether God had chosen them or anointed them or what he even thought of them. And maybe, just maybe someone decided just to shout out, I guess we're all in. Everybody's in. We are the Motley Crew class of Motley High graduates of the love of God and either all of us matter or none of us do. Whereupon, I like to imagine, a visitor from Rome crossed the room and asked a Cretan to dance. I love this story. This is the beginning of the church because the message is clear. If you're going to take yourself out of the party, you'll have to do that all by yourself. Go sit in the corner all by your lonely and frightened self and Try to figure out who the cool kids are. Peter figured it out, and the church would never be the same after he said this, I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but every nation, in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Really? Anyone? As in everyone? And this is what a young Fred Craddock was thinking about when he sat down once with a church committee in a little rural parish in Tennessee years ago when they were trying to decide what the definition of a member was. Who could be a member of this little church in Tennessee and who could not? I mean, obviously, we don't have rules. Look, look at the group we just took in. I mean, <laughs> pretty wide open. But in those days, the Manhattan Project was in full swing, and then Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where this little church was, was a major research site. So all these workers had come from all over the place for the jobs, no doubt, you know, from, you know, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt, even parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and perhaps even Florida, some strange place like that. And some of them were living in trailers because they were migrants but they wanted to come to Fred's little church and the elders would have none of it, so they passed a resolution, quote, only people who own property in this county will be considered for membership in this church. Whereupon Fred said, I resign. Stunned, the elder said, oh, so okay, Fred, um, calm down. What, what, what do you suggest we adopt as a policy for what qualifies a person to be a member of this church? And Fred said, how about this? We'll reject as members only those people we think Jesus would have rejected. And we will accept only those we think Jesus would have accepted. This was followed, of course, by awkward silence. And then they fired him anyway. And this confirms John Wesley's contention that nothing, nothing is as offensive to ordinary people as the grace of God. Years later, Fred returned to the site of that little church. It's now a barbecue joint. And Fred said, really, it's, it's a better barbecue joint than it was a church. For one thing, he said, it serves a much more diverse crowd. <laughs> You've got your Parthians, your Medes. Your Elamites and what holds them together? They love barbecue. <laughs> and I love the end of the story. Unable to come up with a rational reason why these people should not be able to stand one another but are acting like this big rowdy family and obviously they're unaware of the Beach Boys song. So the only thing they can come up with is this. Well, they're filled with new wine. You never notice how people who aren't very happy look at people who look like they're having a good time and say they're drunk. I mean, maybe they are, but not necessarily. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. Maybe they're not drunk on wine. Maybe they're picking up good, 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 good vibrations, like we all did listening to the Piedmont singers, like, like we all do when we visit Nicaragua and see these people that have nothing, but they're so happy. Or like we do when Mayflower does Rebuilding Together, our version of the extreme makeover of someone's house and then the homeowner comes home and we see the expression on their face when they look at their own home transformed by strangers. I might even go so far as to say that in that moment, if we looked around with a little imagination, we might see tongues of fire dancing over everyone's heads. 
and everyone would speak the language of love across all our differences and everyone would understand they're not drunk on wine, they're drunk on love. On this Mother's Day, it's good to remember the first vibration that any of us heard was the beating of our mother's heart. Heartbeats are, in fact, what make us all percussionists. The first voice we heard up close was her voice because good vibrations are the currency of caring. And listen to what people say. Oh, it's just so good to hear the sound of your voice when a friend calls or a loved one whispers words of encouragement, or sometimes when we just look at the world and see the beauty of it clearly and we feel suddenly a part of everything that is, what happens? This shudder runs down our spine. And what do you call that? Goosebumps, good karma, good vibes, doesn't really matter. It's the way the world is made. Vibrations are happening. Dr. King said once, quote, We are constant page turners in each other's lives. Not a quote he's well known for, but this one he is. We must all learn to live together as brothers or we will perish together as fools. Now listen to this. We are tied together in the single garment of destiny, caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. And whatever affects one directly, said Dr. King, affects all indirectly. For some strange reason, he went on, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. This is the way God's universe is made. This is the way it is structured. I did not know he studied quantum physics. A single garment of destiny? That's the luminous web. Or maybe he just observed the way in which life is constantly teaching the essential lesson that for good or for evil, everything really is connected to everything else. There are no inconsequential actions. You should let go of that illusion. And the church needs to divorce itself from doctrine and dogma and just get married again to wisdom. We need to teach and preach a theology of consequence, not a theology of obedience connect the dots. And if you can't connect all of them, just have faith that they'll be connected beyond your ability to comprehend their correct connection. When we do a good deed, but it seems to backfire on us, you know how we have this saying, you've heard it, no good deed goes unpunished. I hear that. It's cute. I just don't think it's true. For one thing, a good deed is its own reward. But for another, We don't see all the consequences because our spiritual vision is so limited. We want everything to happen quickly in ways we can see and celebrate, and this is selfish. I think the truth may be something closer to this. No good deed goes unrewarded. We just don't know how or when or where, and we have a name for this deep trust, this leaning into uncertainty with confidence. You know, we call it um, faith. Because because if everything was easy to understand and easy to be certain about, we would need no faith whatsoever. Well, thank goodness we've gotten some new passengers aboard the good ship Mayflower. Because I've got to tell you, the good deeds of this place are being rewarded in ways we've not yet comprehended. People think we're strange, of course. That's okay. I'm sure some people think we're drunk, but they're wrong. We're just picking up and passing on good vibrations. Good, 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 good vibrations. The Holy Spirit's given us excitations. So there you have it, Pentecost and the Beach Boys. Who knew?